Hello and welcome to My Mom's Basement presented by Barstool Sports and 3G. I am your host, Robbie Fox, and today is the special Eternals recap with Clem. We've both seen the movie, the movie that's all talked about all over the internet. People are saying the worst Marvel movie ever. It's the worst Rotten Tomato score ever. I'm here to say it is not the worst Marvel movie ever. In fact, I liked it quite a bit. I would, I would go as far as saying I really enjoyed myself in the theater watching the entire thing. So Clem... How did you like it? You were a little more skeptical than me going in, I think. The podcast with Jose helped us out, definitely. I saw a lot of listeners also tweeted us, said that helped out. So I'm very glad that it did. And if, if you're still skeptical about the Eternals, you could go listen to last week's podcast and then go see it. Yep, that's the way to go. And we have the writers of the Eternals at the end of this podcast. So they'll kind of give uh, a, a window on how they created everything, which I think yeah. kind of gives you a little idea of what you just watched as well as you know the whole process of it all. And two very cool guys um it was a blast and yeah rob you said it best like again this is by no fault of the internet or critics or people who just you know tweet stuff whatever it's like i think it's the way it goes with everything I, again the, the the movie that should not be named episode uh eight of a certain franchise kind of like poisoned my mind like everything else like when you're told like oh this day is coming this holiday you get your your hopes up so much and if it doesn't hit as you hoped it would hit it kind of falls flat this almost was the uh, the opposite where you had the Rotten Tomato scores worst Marvel movie ever and I'm like I went to it like wait a minute here it's pretty hard to be the worst Marvel movie ever because some of those early Marvel movies fucking sucked and we've talked about them here a whole bunch um Jose's Shout out Jose too. He completely like made this so much easier to like understand. Cause if, if I gone in without Jose's background on everything and you know, if I had not done like maybe like a, a little YouTube video or something beforehand as like a introduction, I would have just been lost. I would have been staring at these giant celestial four <laughs> light eye creatures and being like, what the fuck is going on? But when he kind of explains of how there's such massive, powerful beings, I don't know if they're like living things. So you said it, you, the, the E word, enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I didn't love it. I certainly didn't hate it. I enjoyed it. I liked it. It was, uh, it was a movie that I think is, it's more of like a important movie to set up this phase, I think, yep. than like a movie I'm going to watch a hundred times over. It's not going to be like Guardians, right? Like, to be honest, I, I don't watch it. I, in case you guys don't know, I don't have a ton of free time these days um, with two kids. So it's not like I like rewatch movies other than movies that like I really want to see again. But it's almost like, I guess, uh, the Medi Saints of Newark. I enjoyed it. I liked it. I, 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 it wasn't even close to a Sopranos movie, right? Or a Sopranos show. And I said, the Many Saints of Newark is like the Olive Garden. I love the Olive Garden. I like going there, like eating. I know the tour of Italy is not as good as something I can make on my stove. You know what I mean? I got the Italian blood rushing through me. This is the same kind of thing. I'm not going to confuse this with Endgame. I'm not going to confuse it with Infinity War, Guardians 1 or 2. But it was an important um, movie that's going to have, I think, a long-reaching. It's going to hit space stuff it's gonna hit these you know cosmic beings that can eat planets wink wink potentially in the future <laughs> um and all th all things being said yeah i left being like and listen we've talked about this in the past we're both kind of like we dig history i like when real life history is brought into a comic book movie whether it's Watchmen, whether it's uh wonder woman uh captain loki any of that kind of even, stuff yeah loki yeah and I, I told chaos yeah exactly yeah db cooper i told kfc too i was like dude i don't know if you're gonna watch um eternals but if you do hey get a little bit of background because i know you're gonna fucking hate the celestials and all this like heavy heavy stuff if you don't know what's going in and b there's gonna be some history shit in there which i think he's gonna dig and i really dug that side of it yeah that was awesome that's also something we talked to eternals writers about later on so look forward to that interview it was a great time ryan and kaz furpo great dudes just normal dudes and I, listen i'm not gonna spoil the interview but they did say me and clem get it they said we get it quote unquote we get it so if you're listening to us talk about marvel movies congratulations because you're talking you're listening to two guys who get it talk about marvel movies but before we get into spoilers for the movie just to expand upon what you said it was a movie where i knew it was going to be polarizing when i saw it because of how sci-fi heavy it is how dialogue heavy it is how much they have to set up it's a long movie it's the second longest in the mcu after endgame so it's like you are asking a lot of an audience to learn these 10 new characters, to learn their powers, learn their dynamics. But knowing what we knew from Jose, knowing what they had to accomplish, this vast, this daunting, ambitious task, 
I think they really did as good of a job as they could do. Origin movies are always going to have the origin movie issues where it's like it's going to start a little slow. We're not going to be able to like really connect with the characters till halfway through the movie when you start to feel like you know them. But by the end of this movie, I cared about the Eternals. I thought the final like battle was cool. The CGI in this movie was outrageously good. The uh, deviants and stuff, the way they looked, terrifying, cool. Um, the cast was great. I thought the twists hit for me. I didn't, I didn't expect two things that <laughs> happened. We'll talk about it when we get to the spoilers, but the twist really hit for me. And the, the mid credit scene and the post credit scene were good enough to be like, all right, even if you didn't like the movie, how could you not be excited about what's to come with these people? Worth the price of admission. Yeah. I heard a lot of people saying like, just go, if you don't care about it, just go for the mid and post credit scene. And uh, yeah. And again, I cannot, we're going to have Jose on. We're going to talk Hawkeye. And honestly, like we've heard you guys, we're going to have to do this for like, if not every single big MCU project, everyone that has like some background that we need to learn about or one, anyone that Jose will just do, or if we have, you know, potentially other people who want to do it as well, but Jose was like knocked it out of the park, but he also kind of like, he, he not only like gave me the background and like helped me grasp this whole like crazy world, this cosmic world of the Eternals and the Celestials, but he also was like, listen, the Celestial, like Eternals, like no one, like, I don't really like them. He's like, yeah. their origin story is cool. There's really not a lot there. And I went into this movie two, twofold. One, it's all right. Like, there's probably gonna be a couple of Eternals things here and there. It's not gonna, like this is going to be like the next Iron Man franchise or Spider-Man. We're going to have like a sequel every few years. Um, but it's also like, it's not going to have like, it's not going to be these crazy far reaching stories. It's just going to, they're going to play their role. It's almost going to be like, uh, you're going to have to eat your vegetables. Like if the vegetables are good, awesome. But like the, all the other stuff, I'm sure the, you know, Lo Thor, Love and Thunder and the Guardians movies, those ones are probably going to be a lot more fun than this one was. But like at the same point, I'm invested in the MCU. I'm invested in profession yeah. now that I think about it as well, <laughs> yeah, but I'm invested are. in it personally. Like I want to see this. Um, I want to see the silver surfer come. I want to see the fantastic four come. And I do think that like to have the, and like this Marvel universe where space does play such a big role. You have to have the, you can't like, as they always say, you can't write the history of the NFL without Eli Manning because he beat the Patriots to one to Super Bowls. It's like you can't, I, I don't know if you can write the, the MCU without the Eternals and the Celestials and all these different beings. And if that's all part of this with a fucking, like you said, a kick ass cast and a couple of cool parts along the way, fucking awesome. I, 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 I really did like it. Again, didn't love it. I'm not going to watch it probably when it comes out on Disney Plus or anything like that. But it was, it was perfectly fine in my, in my humble opinion. I would say a welcome entry to the MCU. It's not mind blowing. It's yes. not in the top tier of the MCU. You're not leaving the theater calling all your friends saying you have to see this movie. It's mind blowing. It's game changing. But you leave it and you go, all right, we're on to the next phase. Like, cool. This is what they set up. Cool. There's certain things where it's like, man, did they set up Black Panther 2 in the middle of this movie? I think they <laughs> did. Did they set up this future series? I think they did. So it's like, it's, it's a good bridge into the future of the MCU, the future cosmic world, like you said, the space world, the stuff that's going to get a little confusing. This movie is going to make it a little less confusing because now we know the players, we know their dynamic. We can get right into spoilers. If you haven't seen the Eternals and you still care mm -hmm. about it, I wouldn't listen to the rest of this podcast. I would go see it and I would come back to this podcast. If you don't care or if you have seen the Eternals, strap in because we got a lot to talk about. Folks, I want to tell you about Bare Bottom Clothing. They are on a mission to make the most comfortable, made-to-last menswear around while giving back to the communities where their clothing is made. I mean, comfy season is here, so you might as well stock your closet with comfort without paying the insane markups you see at other big box brands. This stuff is some of my favorite stuff in my entire wardrobe. I say it all the time, but bare bottom clothing is actually what I travel in, like the sweatpants, the t-shirts, the hoodies even. I love it all, and it's the most comfortable stuff I own, so that's why I do travel in it. You could wear it to a date, though. It's versatile, like everything. You wear it to a date. You wear it to the gym. You wear it to the office. It all looks nice. I mean, every time we get a new shipment at Barstool and the podcast that they sponsor send us clothes, I go in, and I realize, oh, everyone's wearing the same stuff as me because it's the nicest stuff in all of our closets. Go to barebottomclothing.com slash basement right now. That's B-E-A-R, like the animal, bottomclothing.com slash basement, and you will get $5 off your first order. Usually, I go through the movie like beat for beat, and I'm like, here's what happened. We'll react to it like that. I told Clem right before we went live. If I tried to do that, 
I think my brain would explode if I tried to like break down and explain every aspect of this movie. So just the general story. We know the Eternals from last week. We know the Eternals were formed by the Celestials to watch over Earth, the machine as they call it, and keep this running so eventually a Celestial would grow. The movie begins. We don't know that. They just think that they're the guardians over Earth. They protect them from deviance and don't interfere in anything else. They show us a bunch of historical elements through the years that really set up why the Eternals are in the state they are modern day in the MCU, which is basically split up. They're kind of all doing their own thing. Kumail's over in Hollywood uh, and Bollywood Kingo, my favorite character in the movie by far. I went in a big Kumail fan expecting to like him the most, and he really was my favorite. So I was like, happy about that. Richard Madden as Icarus comes back to Cersei, which again, the Game of Thrones stuff, the Game of Thrones composers doing this. We got two people from Game of Thrones, a character named Cersei. Game of Thrones all over the place in this movie. All over the place. Comes back to Cersei, tells us the Deviants are attacking. We, we get to see one of them. She's, at this point, with uh, Jon Snow himself, Kit Harrington, Dane Whitman, who will turn into the Black Knight eventually. And the whole movie is a, a team getting back together. You see them going to each member because Ajax, they find dead. Salma Hayek, the leader of the Eternals, I would say the, the face or the, the figure that is at the front at the beginning, at least. And they need to figure out how a deviant killed her and, and what whatnot. The one thing about this movie that I kind of had to make a mental adjustment of while I was watching it, I was expecting like, all right, the team's going to get back together and then the movie's going to start. And the movie's going to kind of unfold from there. This isn't that. This is a movie about the team getting back together. So the entire movie is basically spent getting the Eternals back together. They go to Druig in the forest. That's a big sequence where, you know, he kind of walked away because he realized I could save these people, but they're not letting me. So he's now controlling like a village of people in his own forest and they're just kind of working for him. And it's a, a story about this family, this team getting back together by the time they do and realize the big twist of the Celestials are really just planted them there for the other Celestial to be grown. And then they get their minds wiped and they go and do it again. That hit for me. The twist of Selma Hayek dying at the beginning of the movie, mind blown. I thought she would be in the whole thing. So I was surprised by that right away. Mm -hmm. And then when you tell us it was Icarus and he heel turned it and that really hit for me. I talked to Ken Jack. I was just on Lights, Camera, Barstool this week. You can go listen to it now. We talked about Eternals, Last Night Soho. And he said he saw the twist coming the second Salma Hayek was dead and Richard Madden's like, must be a deviant. Did you see that coming? No, no, not, all not right, at okay. all. Um, it, it like, I feel like whenever you have like, we got to get the band back together and it's the good guys, it does like looking back, I'm like, oh yeah, like there usually is like, and it's one of the guys you would least expect, right? And he's the leader, but he's not the leader, you know? Um, but the way it all played out, not, not in the least. And you figure it would have been the people who discovered her in South Dakota. You wouldn't think it would have been one of them. And obviously yeah. it was Icarus. So, um, yeah, that was, that was completely like a shock, uh, that, that I just, and again, this is me going into it with like the right expectations, I think. And I heard a lot of people saying like, oh, there's a lot of dialogue and people aren't going to like that. The dialogue is either good or it's important to this, like, cause again, the MCU, it's not like, all right. I'm going to have a movie in six months. We're going to have a show and then we're going to have another show. Then we're going to have a movie, then three more shows. Like this is our, this is part of our life. It's like a fucking sports league that just doesn't end. It, that we, This is all going to be a very important part. So I was like, let's go in. Like, it's basically like a comic book. Think of it this way. Yeah. I'm not like, no one reads anymore. And you said it perfect. The thing about the shows is they allow you to give these arcs where you, you, you maybe not aren't going to do a full blown movie on it. Or if you want to just have a little like what if thing and like a little niche thing that people can have fun with. And Hey, maybe it, it plays a bigger a role in the long term i just spent eleven dollars to go to the movies the other night that was a limited dollar comic book it was an eleven dollar graphic novel right i don't i don't have time i barely have time to watch a movie for two hours let alone read a graphic novel or whatever for however long that takes i don't know because i don't have time to read but when i saw the, the text crawl in the beginning i'm like all right like let's let's pull up let's let's read some you know and i kind of liked how they were giving the history and the six singularities which had you know obviously the infinity stones and stuff like that and i was like this is just me taking in like i felt uh it was like the mature Marvel movie. I felt like it I was, was watching, yeah. right? and, and I told yeah. you, don't bring your daughter to this one. I said, no, 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 no. It, yeah. it's not for her. It's a, it is the more mature Marvel movie. And I could see why it's polarizing. I could see why maybe people don't like that element of it. But for me, like what's the one main complaint or knock against the MCU in the past few years. People like to say that all of the movies are formulaic. It's basically the same mm -hmm. movie with different characters plugged in. People like to say that. 
The Eternals breaks that mold completely. This is, I, I said, if you told me The Eternals is not a Marvel movie and it's not a DC movie and you took out like, you know, the references to the Avengers and whatnot, this could pass as a completely separate entity. And I liked that about mm -hmm. it. I liked that we are really going in different directions. Hawkeye is about to be a Christmas show. We're about to have these things that are so themselves they're so niche and and singular for what they're going for that you can't say that anymore you can't say they all fit into the same box because try to put iron man in the eternals movie it doesn't work you know it's just like a this is more serious this is more sci-fi elemental cosmic like you said and a little more adult there's a fucking sex scene we got the first sex scene in marvel thrusting yeah all that uh, and i try i'm, I'm going to try not to make this weird right now but if you're not going to give me Cersei, who's, I mean, that woman is gorgeous. I'm sorry. Yeah. Whoever she is, I don't know. I didn't know what she was going to Chan, yeah. If, if you're not going to give me her, you're going to get my guy, Rob Stark. Let me see a little Rob Stark ass, all right? I can make sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. I am secure enough in my sexuality. <laughs> I respect Rob Stark. I respect Rob guy. Stark, too. He fucking, he's a hot man. dude. Yeah. And he always ends up with the hot, because, you know, his his wife in Thrones, I mean, that is a 10 out of Talia, I believe her name was. Like, I yeah. was, I had the biggest crush on her. I So I had, the, I had the biggest crush on her. I had the biggest crush on Cersei, which again, the Game of Thrones cross-referencing was like making, when he's like, Cersei. I'm like, wait, you shouldn't <laughs> be talking to Cersei like you want her. She's very bad. We don't like the Starks. No and how great is it in the beginning, her. like when he first, confronts cersei and, and dane and like when they first come face to face the whole theater like looks at each other like putting game of thrones game of thrones right here yeah it's like it's like the first time you saw like um you know like the outsiders were in the wcw ring you're like oh my god except i guess wcw is closer to dc let's be honest in this scenario but it's and still it like play people people i said this and people were like is that a knock on the movie it's not a knock on the movie because there are some dc movies that i like quite a bit this felt to me a lot like a very good dc movie sometimes more than it felt like mm. a marvel movie the, the, the seriousness of it the scene with uh in the forest with druig which we talked a little bit about later it's a it's actually a reference they they made a little homage to a leonardo dicaprio movie in that sequence just everything was a little more muted than it normally is in the mcu there were a little less jokes in this it felt like a good dc movie to me that is a great call how do you say that yeah it's like i could almost it almost like it has a different like taste and smell as i'm like yeah. thinking it over and it's like yeah you don't have the spider-man suit you don't have you know the x-men stuff it's like you have like this muted thing because i didn't know the eternals existed until the trailer <laughs> came out you know whenever it was a year or two i don't know everything time doesn't make sense anymore um and yeah and then the fact that it's not like you're living in the, uh, it's like, let's be honest, if, if everything took place in New York, it would feel like a Marvel movie because that's where yep. everything fucking takes place. <laughs> it seems. This one, you're going to Mesopotamia, you're going to bad one. And that's the other thing. Like I said, big history nerd, would have been a history teacher, except I was told history teachers don't pay well. And now I work at, I'm a fucking blogger. So it's like, shit, <laughs> it doesn't mean a difference in terms of getting paid. Um, I love this. The Fertile Crescent, Bob, the Fertile Crescent is an all time great name. Shout out to whoever came up with that one. And I, I you know something is good when I'm going online and reading about history. Let's be honest, on Wikipedia, not like I'm going deep dive <laughs> onto some like real website. But I was like, I was like, shit, man, Babylon looks so cool. I gotta read a little bit about Babylon. And I just love seeing these like ancient empires where everything looked new. They're not in ruins, and it just it, it looked actually like um a lot of the stuff in East and Asos in uh, Thrones. You know, it looks so yeah. cool and yet like modern at the same point. And I I don't know. I I really dug the shit out of it and like. Then you see the, I don't know where that was, um, where you said where Druid took over in like, you know, South or yeah, Central yeah. America, where the, like the conquerors came in and they're just like fucking using the guns and shit like that. I don't know. I, that, that is like, that tickles my nerd bone right there. That Same, kind of that, stuff. That was and one of my I favorite really scenes in the movie. Like when they're in the forest with Druid and then Fina is kind of going crazy. And uh, what was it? Gilgamesh? Was that the name? He has to like keep her he has to keep her sane basically and has to make sure she doesn't attack the team. And then we're also working about worrying about Icarus. Like it's a lot, it's definitely a lot to take in, but it worked for all my like nerd, nerd bones and they hit my, the nerd itch or whatever. Like it really worked in that sense. And all the stuff you were talking about, like visually, this movie is stunning. It's awesome. From the yeah. flashbacks to even what the Eternals were wearing, their costumes were so well designed and the the spaciness of it they had a little like ashy feel but they also when they would make things out of like when um fina would make her weapons the look and design of that cgi wise just the gold trim 
that was amazing. So like visually, I thought this was an awesome Marvel movie. Like, and as I mentioned, the deviants, one of my favorite looks that the Marvel movies had. Now I'll say this, when the deviants started evolving and started talking, I didn't really like that. I was like, eh, I could have done it without that. I was a little like, just uh, another aspect of the movie that only muddied it a little. I could have rather them just been savages the whole movie. Yeah, or where it got to the point where they were based, they were really evolving, but it was like a slow but steady process. And then it's like we have like Eternals versus Eternals without, you know, suits on basically, right? Yeah. But it felt like that that did feel a little half-baked. When it was all said and done, I'm like, th- that didn't hit the way I was expecting it to. It, and then I, <laughs> at some point I thought he was against Icarus and then he's with Icarus. So I that, again, that felt like a little flat for me as well. You could have kept him as savages, was- have the Eternals beat him at some point. And then the rest of the movie is just about like, oh my God, I can't believe we've been lied to all these years. Icarus turns on the team. Now we have to stop the Celestial. Like that, you have more than enough to wrap up your big conclusion without the talking Skarsgård's uh, deviant, whatever. Yeah, exactly. And like, again, yeah, or you just have like the big swinging dick who's just like evolving on his own, but it, it just felt very quick the way it all went so yeah i'm with you on that a hundred percent and yeah like the the suit and i'm sure even like the i'm sure the music but everything like like was graphically stunning i always say the lcb guys i'm like ken jack probably knows like all the things they hit on that i'm like oh, my does, dumb yeah. brain i was just like that looked pretty fucking cool uh, so <laughs> i you know my dumb brain liked it i imagine people actually know what they're talking about really enjoy- again movie like i thought it was a good movie ken jack probably enjoyed it as a film like there's yeah, two different yeah, yeah. things that they submitted it for like awards right they like like um, this was a, it like festival, a film like festival yeah it was the first marvel movie to yeah. debut at a film festival and uh, going back to the history thing i think my favorite parts of of like uh like my history classes, like World War II, I think everyone loves like learning about World War II, which again, you get the Hiroshima thing and yeah. that like, that's like, holy shit. And you get to see like, you know, ground zero, basically that. But then I was also really big into like mythology. I love learning about like the Greek, the Greek gods and then the Roman gods and how there was, you know, a little bit of just kind of was like updated versions of that. Cause obviously all the shared history and, and the people who, you know, lived right there. And the fact that like Athena and the from Olympia is the name of the planet. And then it's like Olympus, <laughs> yeah. you know, Mount Olympus and shit like that. Again, nerd bone was tickled. Icarus, like you find out that Sprite was the one who said Icarus burned his wings because he flew too close to the sun. Uh, we get a little bit of Camelot, King Arthur. I mean, and again, and that's going to hit a whole other thing. So C- King Arthur confirmed MCU. Uh, the DC universe has the been DC, consumed. Yeah. What the fuck? The <laughs> they're, they're dropping Superman lines, Alfred in terms of Batman. I'm like, holy shit. I think someone said Star Wars was even referenced. So Star I'm Wars like, was referenced. Shit. There's a Star Wars book in this movie. You see like the Star Wars logo. We were like, what the fuck? <laughs> Uh, so Eternals, I mean, it's not just, you know, phase four or any other kind in terms of characters and shit. Like, we're just consuming. They've just taken over. They're like, fuck it. It's all real. It's all part of the MCU. So I love this is and this movie. There's some three G. This is some three G level. Oh, my movie God. I can't on. wait till it's on <laughs> Disney Plus. I'm going to eat a three G brownie, a sugar cookie, a Delta eight root beer taffy. And then I'm in on it. And then I'm going to like I'm going to feel like I have that little circle come out of my chest. I'm going to be like, oh, here I go. I'm talking to the Celestials now. Um, eventually, uh, the- Prime Eternal is that what it's called? If yeah, you're, Prime you're Eternal, a Prime yeah, Eternal, right? I'll be the Prime yeah. Eternal. That should be a strand. <laughs> that should be a strain. Prime Eternal. That is a good strain. Name. The conclusion of the movie comes when they form the Unimind, as they were saying. And by the way, the way the team worked together, so good. I haven't seen superhero teamwork like that since Endgame or even The Incredibles. Like the super speed, uh, the deaf girl who would like punch people a thousand times. Then Kumail comes out of nowhere with the finger guns. And then Icarus has like, basically he's Superman. He's basically Superman powers. He's got the light beams. He could fly all that. Awesome. Icarus eventually decides, you know what? I'm going to give up. I'm going to stop trying to fight the Eternals. Clearly what they're doing, they're all together on this. Maybe I'm the one out and very on the nose flies into the sun. <laughs> what, a, what a fucking move that was. Just yeah. flies into the sun. <laughs> suicide by sun. I just, that's what I, like, I'm like, I did some notes during this. I'm like, suicide by sun is such like a, it's, it's such like a, it's kind of a hard move. Let's be honest. And it's like, I, I, I think I did this. Um, it's like when, you, I don't know if you ever did this, but like, I remember when my parents, if I yell at me, I'd be like, all right, fine. And I'd like punish myself. Work. <laughs> I like put the soap in my mouth myself just to like take the power away from them. It's like, dude, you don't have to go into the fucking sun, but I guess he kind of had to live up to that, that myth. Right. It was fucking, uh, 
check off sun uh, fucking sprite yeah. told it years earlier and here he is going to the Although sun i like did see unbelievable yeah, I, I forget who it was it might have been chloe the director chloe Zhao, or it might have been kevin feige himself he said no eternal is truly dead and salma hayek said she signed on for multiple more movies so like we're gonna see some version of them in the future i think i don't think we're, we've seen the last of rob stark icarus i don't think we've seen the last of uh ajak i i, I think they're gonna be back yeah, I could see that too, because again, and then I know for a lot of people that was like, oh, they're not um, these like everlasting beings. They're actually robots and stuff like that. I'm like, whatever, trying to figure out who's what and who's not in the MCU. Like, and now it's like shreds of, is what's it Kenya scrolls, Eternal? What's robots? What's Eternals? What's Celestial? Like, holy fuck. This is yeah. breaking my brain if already. His parents about fucking, it. and then how is Thanos <laughs> coming out if his parents are Eternals, and then it's like, can Thanos fuck? Or is that why and he's how did adopting Thanos kids? Par- how, how did his parents fucking make him with that little, you know, nutsack yeah. on his chin? And then they make Harry Styles. What the fuck? I, Talk about careful, Bob. Good genes. Careful, Bob. Don't be talking about <laughs> Big T like that. It's like, boy, that's Big Purple. Don't you, don't you slander my guy. Don't you slander my guy. Hey, all right. Let's go. We say it in the interview, but say it with me now. Listen, the earth would have been cooked. There wouldn't have been, Ajax wouldn't have been fucking sounding the alarms. They wouldn't have been uniting because Ajax wouldn't have fucking saw all humanity rise together and bring back everyone with a snap. So ipso facto by transitive property, I don't know if I'm using that correct. Thanos saved earth by doing the snap. True or false? True or false? True. True. It's true. True. Unfortunately, the writer it, said it himself. Listen, Spoiler there's other, there's to the other interview. people involved. It's not just Thanos. If it was just Thanos, he wouldn't have saved the universe. But with the help of other people, Captain America included, yes, sure, Thanos kind of saved the universe. Let's talk oh, about the okay. and post credit scenes as well, because these were some of the most talked about things of the movie, like we mentioned. Harry Styles in the first one, he introduces himself to a couple of the Eternals on their ship, and he is Star Fox. He is Thanos' brother. He has a little gnome sidekick, the little dwarf guy. And the CGI on him, a little weird. Like, that was the, the one part of the movie where I was like, oh, he looks like a CGI creature. Yeah, everything else looked amazing. Uh, and he has swagger off the jump. You could see Harry Styles' charisma come through in this 30-second appearance where they introduce him as the brother of Thanos. They say it twice. They're like, brother of Thanos? Holy fuck. So you know it's a big moment meeting him. They play a great foreigner tune off the back. Guardians vibes up the, up the ass. And it, it was just... It was cool. It got a pop in the theater. I got it spoiled for me. This was the one thing that I got spoiled going into the movie. Oh, as soon as, yeah, really? Unfortunately, as soon as some dickhead from Variety left the uh, film festival, he tweeted, Harry Styles joins the MCU in the post credit scene and then tried to defend himself saying it wasn't a spoiler. It was like a scoop. He's like, that's just news. And it's like, well, why don't you wait for the fucking movie to come out to put that news out, dude? Because he spoiled it for me. He spoiled it for a bunch of other people. It was still a cool reveal. And then in the second, the actual post credit scene, not the mid credit scene, we get to see Dane Whitman. He walks up to this chest. He opens it up, and there's a sword in there, the ebony blade. And it kind of calls to him. You hear this demonic stuff, kind of like uh, when Ray like, opens up the chest in A Force Awakens, and the lightsaber yep. kind of calls to her. Same vibes there. And you hear a voice say, like, are you sure about that, Mr. Whitman? Immediately, I was like, whose voice was that? The people next to me in the theater, they said, oh, that was Nick Fury. I was like, fucking idiots. That wasn't Nick Fury. It's the most recognizable voice in the world. Not him. Who was it? Mahershala Ali as Blade. Are you kidding me? We got fucking Blade wrapped in this? And I referenced Black Panther 2 before. You got to be a fool if you don't think the, the Celestial coming up through the Earth is disrupting things with Atlantis and the Submariner. Oh, I didn't even think of that aspect. That makes perfect. That makes absolutely perfect sense. Where does that? Do they say where it takes place? It might take place around where Wakanda could be too, because I know they had mentioned. It. I mean, Atlantis could be fucking huge. And at this point, Great the celestial call. is like the hand is is there. It's coming out. Yeah. About, it's like part of the Earth now. It's just there's a there's a hand in the, in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i love how like if that just came and be like oh look at that crazy like we blog it and be like what the fuck's going on down there <laughs> aliens aliens people be like it's probably Ron, a Jimmy right. Kimmel stunt <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> um i i had no idea i was i was the first one like is that nick fury who the fuck is? like i had to look i got home because i'm like i didn't see a voice coming out off the, sc- off the screen i didn't think about blade being involved so we got blade we got vampires coming in um i also don't know much about the black knight who Me he's neither. gonna I become i guess that'll be a jose thing we'll have to get him back 
that's a big Jose thing. And um, the blade, it like consumes you. It makes you, it's like called the black blade or something like that. Right. And it like, I think the it ebony makes blade, you, yeah. Ebony blade. Yes. Ebony blade. It, shout out my guy, Ebony Maul. And it kind of makes you like, um, like you, you're invincible. Basically it fucks, it fucks people up. All I know about it is it's in like that the Lego Mario. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, this was a thing that I hadn't noticed at first. And then I was reading someone's uh, talking about it. She gives him the ring of his family name, Cersei. And she do talk about Camelot. So I feel like there might be a little, cause I was, my notes here is like, yo, Jon Snow got fucked in this movie. He is worthless. They just threw him on the poster and they throw him in the trailer. Like, oh, sweet Jon Snow. And I was like, he does nothing. Turns out might be a much bigger piece, which I'm very happy we're going to have uh, Kit Harrington. I'm, I'm going to call him John Snow. If, the, yeah. if his mama named him Snow, I'm going to call him Snow. Or <laughs> I guess his uncle named him Snow in this case. Uh, speaking of uncles, having, first of all, I have a real problem. I, Eros is Thanos' brother's name, and they call him Star Fox, right? My old ass, I hear Star Fox. I think of Super Nintendo and the Nintendo 64 game. Do a barrel roll. Do a barrel roll. <laughs> so it's going to fuck me up. But I, if, if this guy, if Harry Styles can deliver, I'm all into, he could take the Star Fox name away. Um, the music was like straight out of Guardians, like we yeah. had said. And um, I kind of like, I really, like, they really, they, they had, they already said the team man once. I feel like we're going to get a good amount of team man, like vibes. If this, if we get Harry Styles in Guardians, which would be like a perfect mix, him and Pratt going back and forth, that would be awesome. And then like, I would love to see him be, be and I'm going to date myself here, but Rod Belding, who was, you know, Mr. Belding's brother, he's like the cool uncle. I want to see cool uncle Star Fox coming around and Nebula and Gamora like, oh, how's it going he's like how are my girls doing i think that could be a lot of fucking fun here so like i'm excited and again this is all part of eternals hitting all these different parts they have to build up the scale of the mcu and it's still going to touch a lot of favorite franchises and like they mentioned thor which i thought was great too and they're like oh he's an avenger now like again like it's tickled my mcu nerd bone as well there was so much stuff here to love also speaking of the celestial i think we have our new hashtag here for the episode Goes two ways though. Killing a baby celestial. Because that's a little baby. <laughs> is that like killing baby Hitler? Is that like going back in time and killing baby Hitler? Or are the Eternals is. baby killers? Hashtag Eternals are baby killers. I think that could work, but that's a very problematic. Hashtag. Listen, I said they did, uh, they're doing the right thing. If you're saving me on Earth, I also like the thing about like Earth has to like humanity has to be good for the Eternals to gain power. Like that's a cool little fold that Jose was telling us about before the movie. Like as long as the people on earth and what we'll get into the interview, like the snap was huge for the Eternals, like earth fighting back earth, defending itself. That was a changing point for them. I feel like we can get into the interview now, unless you have anything else on the, on the movie you wanted to touch on. That Gil, 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 Gilgamesh. I can't, I don't know. Gilgamesh. The names. Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh. That poor dude, he's the big dude, he's strong. He's, like, really funny and nice. Being locked in the friend zone with Angelina Jolie for, like, thousands of years has to be, like, it's it's like a Greek tragedy in itself. That might be, like, a real-life tra- the, the Greek tragedy of more, like, <laughs> Jolie just stunning. And it was kind of cool, like, I was re- I was I was watching a YouTube and they said like maybe the the deaf part of it and then her having the uh, what do they call it when she had like her eyes started glowing she had like the everyone's gonna die they I called forget, it like the I forget wear- what they called it because I saw a little before yeah it was like med wearing or I don't anyway I people said it could just be like when you keep hitting the reset button on these robots <laughs> sooner or later like it's it's not gonna work as well it's you keep you know resetting your phone or your computer shit's gonna stop working as well so I like that uh, Pat Oswalt is pip right yeah is that, that was is that confirmed yeah. okay yep um and oh th- three questions two okay yeah, three questions for you bob one do you know the eternals by their names yet or is it john snow is it salma hayek is it jolie I, I know about half of them by their names i would say i'm at like 50 percent. yes me too i'm at uh, like it's weird angelina jolie who obviously i know angelina jolie but she's Thena. like i'm like yep. that's Thena. it's also like Easy, the yeah. ones the the easy names to remember that you already knew from like Greek mythology, Icarus. I know Icarus. I know Cersei because the name, and I'm in love with her. Uh, oh, it's easy it's because like, it's a drink and a little kid. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, I I kind of was like, I didn't really love Sprite. I was like, all right, Sprite. You're just. I think yeah. she played the I role very Sprite. well. It's like yeah. I think Sprite's supposed to be a little bit pain in the ass. Yeah, this, this, um, but like I actually thing with her going back and forth and her being in love with Icarus, but she's like, it can't work because I'm a kid. It was just a little weird. I didn't need to hear any of that. Agree when we, especially when we saw her like 
become like this older woman at the bar earlier. It's like just do the like do the mystique. Just act yeah. like someone else. Like it's you're already, not like, actually you don't, eleven. Just because you look like them. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you're like eleven. You're, you're eleven million. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um. And then like, yeah, like, then it's like, oh, guy with the strong hand. And, you know, it is still kind of Dinesh. Uh, but, okay. So that that means they did an all right job of calling yep. by their names. Next, your favorite Eternal. Kingo. Definitely Kingo, yeah. And you said it. You love Kingo. You loved, like, his, uh, the dynamic with, like, the guy his who cameraman, was, like, his valet. ancient or his, yeah. Guy, yeah, his valet. And I loved, I like I said, when I first saw him, I was like, oh, I'm going to hate this. Then I liked it. And then by the end, I loved it. I love they just kept pulling cameras out. Like, you got, <laughs> it's like the Peter Griffin with the knee jump. Like, keep I mean, it going, the, the I start funniest to like line it. in the movie for me, I think, was when Kumail gets like puked on or he gets all the goo on him. And he's like, did you get that? And you just hear his valet from the distance like, yes, I did, sir. And he's like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I'd like to like the, the guy who changed uh, Druig. Druig I, was cool. Yeah, uh, he was cool. The actor had like a little bit of like a fuck you to him. So it's like, I don't like this guy. But by the end, like I, I dug I dug all their powers. I like the guy who was able to invent shit and he was like doing the steam engine. Yeah. So there was a, I, I guess my favorite turn, I, I kind of like the idea that that even though Icarus was like the quote unquote and so badass, I kind of like that Athena could just like, she was the closest thing to his rival. I killed the, uh, at the end there. And then last one, we got to do it. If the Eternals was a fast food item, oh, what yeah. would that fast? This is our, you know, instead of one to 10, this is our review here. This is how we're going to leave it here. So you got to think of something that the Eternals is um, in terms of a fast food item for the review. You want me to go? I'll go first. You go first. Yeah. I'll go first. Okay. So I was going to go with this and I think it's a little bit of a risky thing to go with here. Um I'm really oh, thinking man. this is a hard one. The other ones I felt like I would have something come to mind like immediately. And this one, I'm trying to think of a fast food item that I liked that I know not everyone likes, that I know it's like kind of my taste. Yeah. It still hits, you know? Like I'm kind of thinking, and this might be giving it too much credit. For some people, they'll say you're giving the Eternals too much credit. First thing that comes to mind is uh, Burger King onion rings. Because I love the Burger King onion rings. I'll get them with every order. I'm like, oh yeah. But some people are like, onion rings, what the fuck are you talking about? So I got, I get how it's polarizing. But for me, I really like Burger King onion rings. Okay, I can dig that. This, I, I'm going with the same kind of logic with mine, except I don't think it's, I think it's pretty much beloved, which, you know, I, I wouldn't say Eternals is beloved. I do think it's more liked than the general critics would give it credit for. Yeah, fans I'm going definitely like the, the Frost critics. 100%, 100%. I'm going with the frosty at wendy's because it's like you just put it on the side it's important because it ties the whole meal together it gives you a little dessert afterwards you can even have it as a drink if you don't have you know money for a drink you kind of just sip on it whatever you want to do but it just it ties the meal together i think it's, Eternals it, is going to tie the mcu the together meal. that's a good one you cannot have that as the meal hell <laughs> yeah. no just so you can't have the onion rings as the meal like, yeah. If, you, yeah if you do that you deserve to be like you, you should be taken away from the past <laughs> you can't be eating frosties and onion rings as a meal and that's coming from a junk food connoisseur i still you still can't do that so okay i i dig that i think we hit that as good as you can hit it because i think that 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 sums up the essence of this movie so burger king onion rings and if you like just like with the burger king onion rings you might be eating some fries one day. You might be like, you know, eating your Thor fries or your Guardians fries. You're like, oh, I got an Eternal in here. I got a little onion ring. It's I always got a nice Star to get that old, You'll old be onion. excited about it. Yeah, you'll definitely. Coming yeah. out of this movie, that's another thing I think it did so well is I want to see more of the Eternals. I want to see them do different stuff. I want to see past the origin. So they did a good job of establishing likable characters in that way, or at least engaging characters. Even the ones that weren't likable were engaging. Oh man, if there's like, yeah, if, if you're watching Guardians and all of a sudden all like the people start walking away, you're like, what the fuck? Oh, Druid's here. Like, hey, that's my onion ring. There you go. So, all right. I think, I think we came to a, a good conclusion to this movie. That's comment below. Give us your fast food item. Give us that item fast food item. Movie. And make sure you like the video, subscribe, do all yep, that stuff. Subscribe. Because Hawkeye's Alerts. coming up. We're going to be doing weekly Hawkeye reviews and then we're back. That's like my mom's basement back in full swing. And I can't wait for that. It's been even with what if like that was an animated show. So it was awesome. But now we're like back to live action, live action. So I'm going to throw it to a little advertisement here and then we'll get right into our interview with Ryan and Kaz Furpo, two of the writers of The Eternals.
Big news in shoes. Rothy's is now selling men's sneakers and men's driving loafers. Even more big news, they just launched premium merino wool shoes for fall. Merino wool is nature's perfect material. Soft, comfortable, machine washable, and sustainable. It's available in cool colors and classic styles you'll want to wear everywhere. This is perfect for fall. I've seen these. They are awesome. And if that wasn't enough, Rothy's just launched their first ever collection of accessories for men. So they got wallets, carry bags, card cases. They've got all your everyday carry essentials. No more worrying about keeping your wallet clean after weeks of wear. You could throw these right in the machine, washing machine. Boom, throw it right in there. Everything that they make is washable. It's amazing. I've got some shoes from there. You throw them right in the wash. Clean. It's awesome. I love Rothy's. And to help welcome your fall in style, Rothy's is doing something special. So that's right. They gave us a chance to share this super rare opportunity with our listeners for a limited time. You can get $20 off your first purchase. $20 off at rothys.com slash basement. That is R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash basement. Head to rothys.com slash basement now to find your new favorites. Hello and welcome back to My Mom's Basement. It is Robbie Fox. It is Clem. And we've got two of the writers of The Eternals, Kaz and Ryan Furpo. Guys, how are you? We're thrilled to be really here, well. Robbie. Thanks for having us, man. This is, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's been a great weekend, you know, and this is, it's a, it's a crazy movie. We hope people go see it on the biggest possible screen. It's one of those kinds of stories that we hope you go and it blows your mind a little bit. Now, you just told us off camera about or off uh, recording about an amazing story. You just took your grandmother to see this movie. And what was the last movie she saw in theaters? That is correct. I took my, my 95-year-old grandma to see a movie in theaters with the whole, with the whole family. And I, I was talking to her about it before we went in. And I was trying to figure out, like, when was the last time you saw a movie in the theaters? And she told me it was Star Wars. And I said, like, which which one? And she's like, I think there's only one. So the last <laughs> time she saw a movie was probably 1979 Star Wars A New Hope. So it's only been about 42 years, which feels right to go from Star Wars in theaters to Eternals. Um, but it was a great story. It was a great moment. I didn't even realize it myself. If she says she likes it more than Star Wars, it's like, well, my baby made it. So it's like, you're good no matter what. It's a high bar to clear, though. You're going to Star Wars. Yeah, the original. The original in London. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah that, but no, it, was, opening, it was an honor. Uh, the opening of Eternals is kind of like an homage to A New Hope. So I wonder if she's sitting there being like, is this how all movies start? They just start with a spaceship. I didn't even realize that was an homage, but looking back, like, of course it is. Like the giant spaceship yeah. coming out of nowhere, and you're like, oh my like God. Flying over your head. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 2001, uh, English Patient. Like, there's even some homages to Lawrence of Arabia. Like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of weird stuff in there. We had to dig hard. How did you guys get attached to this movie in the first place? Like, how does this connection happen and you get involved in the MCU? Well, yeah, so we were cousins, first of all, and we grew up in the Bay Area uh, nearby each other. So we kind of knew each other. I mean, we hung out a lot growing up and we both early on were uh, gravitated towards um, uh, art and, you know, drawing, storytelling, writing, all these things. And that kind of eventually evolved into filmmaking. And so we had like this kind of unofficial collaboration for many, many years, um, where we just would like share stories with each other, share films, like make little short films together. And then um, after we had both kind of like established ourselves um, as career filmmakers and had had, had some success, Kaz in commercials, me in documentaries, um, Kaz actually approached me and said, hey, uh, we've been kind of sharing stuff all these years, had this unofficial collaboration, let's do something together for real. And let's write a script that we can go make for like a million bucks, like in Eastern Europe somewhere. And so we wrote this script called Ruin, um, which was our first official collaboration. And that script, um, it was, there's, you know, through a roundabout way, it got out into Hollywood and just really caught fire and, uh, and kind of led to the, the launch of our, our career. And, and through that script, we had all these kind of general meetings that, um, and just kind of met everyone all over town. And one of those meetings was with uh, Nate Moore at Marvel. And we had a really good, uh, good meeting with him and just talked all about phase four and what it could be. And, but it was very like general, but we really clicked. And so we didn't really hear from him for like eight months. And then in that time, we sold another script to Netflix and then our script Ruin won the blacklist. And then so shortly after that, uh, the following year, we got a call from Nate and said, hey, I got this crazy project, I'd love to talk to you about. And we went in and it was, it was Eternals. And, and right from the beginning when we heard about it, because we had never heard of the Eternals before, 
when we heard about the what it what it was though we just knew that there was so much crossover between all the stuff that we were interested in and, and that the type of stories we want to tell that we just had to make that movie and it just became our kind of like quest our holy grail uh prize that we that, that we went after and uh you know fortunately we won it yeah and to that end i would just kind of add like ryan and i both came at filmmaking from like really different angles like i went straight into like film school, film brat, like knew I wanted to do it. Like, and Ryan basically dropped out of film school, made a feature film with like 5,000 bucks with his friends, like skating in San Francisco. So it was like two it's sides like the of the Kevin Smith point. method. Like literally, yes, we, li exactly. we literally got all the contacts in both sides of that universe, which was a lot of fun, you know, and, and they both paid off. And really like when you talk about the roundabout way, it's like, it couldn't be more roundabout. We had like no family in Hollywood, like no uncle we could call up and be like, give me the internship. It was just like, we literally wrote a script it was basically a mom's basement in his dad's cabin in the woods, yeah. like straight up. Mm -hmm. We went to this cabin in the woods with no power, like just wrote this movie for like two and a half weeks, never left, like literally did not leave for two weeks. So and then we did, came back. Yeah, please. No, I'm, I was just going to say, so did you write the Eternals part and he did the Deviants part? Like I'm trying to like think of this. Yeah. How, how do you collaborate? How do two humans write a script yeah. together? No, man. I mean, really we, it's, we both approach story in like really similar but really different ways. You know, I like to look at the world and mythology and, and Ryan really looks at the character, but through that we've both kind of learned how to be better at the things that, you know, are our weaknesses and our strengths. So yeah. you write so much of writing a script, I always say this, it's like imagine doing like a one thousand piece puzzle in your imagination, like just in your mind. Yeah. You're like, okay, you got the corners, you gotta get the edges right, and you're just trying to keep track of like how this shit works together. So when you do that, you start to like make a roadmap and so ryan knows like well this scene connects to this scene which is going to connect to this scene and he'll might be working on like the second act break while i'm working on the third act and then he'll come and rewrite my scenes and i'll rewrite his scenes and it just that's literally the process yeah. it's just you it's, don't stop rewriting a movie until it's done the simplest metaphor for how it all works can be found in the movie itself which is the unimind we, we just oh, basically yeah. sit down do a little meditation and just mind merge and and uh and then the magic comes out that's all Awesome. And you guys said how you guys had, you know, storytelling and art growing up. Was there, were you guys, did you guys get into comic books as kids? Was there a certain comic book or, a, you know, a hero or a group, a team that you were into? Or was it just kind of like, you know, catch some stuff in the movies, TV shows, anything like that? Um, the, the trading cards, apparently the, the comic trading cards are a consistent thing for like guys like me who grew up in the 90s. Yeah. So did you guys have any comic book franchises you like growing up? I, yeah. Sorry, Greg. Well, I was just going to say, like, I took, I grew up in the woods, like where I am right now, like literally like dirt road, like country, like you usually pee outside because it's just easier. <laughs> so for me, it was like, literally, you would like make your own lightsabers and then just go make up stories, you know? So I, it was Star Wars for me was like a life changing thing, you know? I, I used to play, yeah, I think everyone had like action figures, action figures. Yep. Are they still big? Like, do people still play with action figures? I just don't know. Cause they I were so big I think it's so more like adults that collect up. them than kids that play with them. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, thank you, Robbie. That's how I feel about it. It just feels like I had so many of these things as a kid. And that was really like, I have to say, that was a lot of what like Eternals, writing Eternals was like, we had these cards that we made for each character. I mean, there's 10 main characters. And so we this way we could physically move the cards around when we're like, designing set pieces and setting up action scenes we'd be like okay so makari's here and we'd literally like use the cards and act out the set pieces for like physically where they went and that's what it was the same shit that i was doing when i was nine years old in my you know my mom's basement literally like playing around being like i got these toys and then you'd kind of make action movies by yourself like in your room and then i got i literally got a camera my dad's like little still camera and I would start making stop motion videos. That's really how it started when I was like nine years old. So I'd use these like X, I literally had a Wolverine action figure. This, so if you want to ask me like, let's be literal, it's X-Men. X-Men was like really pivotal. My guy, that's, yeah. that's my like, team. Right my, my X, my Wolverine figure was like prized possession. I probably still have it somewhere. And like that would, he would always be the star of the little action movies I made in my room. And that, you know, those same like that imagination you develop when you're nine years old. I mean, like I have to say, even when you're making movies in Hollywood, it's the same thing just like the different scale you know i love to hear you say that because i also used to make stop motion movies with little legos i would like make little star Dude, wars yeah. lego stop motion movies it was like my yeah. favorite thing um Wait, i yeah, literally have those movies i yeah, still have them like uh, there's like a kit right you could buy like a kit that even came yeah. with like a little webcam that you could use yep. yeah and some software 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. One of the things that I love the most about the Eternals is it feels like this universe and um, not obviously the MCU we've known for 10 years now, but the universe of the Eternals and the Celestials feels lived in. It feels like this has existed in the shadows for so long. And one of my favorite aspects of it is them reacting to moments in history like Hiroshima, some like mm-hmm. dark, deep moments. Did you guys always know which moments in history you were going to hit or were there other ones that you were thinking about putting in there? Because those were some of my favorite scenes in the movie. I really appreciate I that. I, I'll just say briefly, like I was a, a classics minor in school. Like when I went to film school, I also studied like Greek and Roman literature. Like I went and worked on an archaeological dig in Egypt for four months in my senior year of college. And so any of those, like there's so much that we tried to bring. Like, I mean, there's not an accident that the Domo is a pyramid. You know what I mean? Like that's the type of thing that, that it comes, people see it throughout history. Maybe it inspired the pyramids. Like, I don't know. I don't make up the ancient alien rules, but we just wanted to play very much with that sense of reality because the truth is every you know, uh, culture throughout history has dealt with these sort of stories of super powered beings, gods, heroes, myths. These stories exist in every culture and we've been telling the same ones for 2000 years. You know, the MCU for me is an extension of those same hero myths. And so getting to tap into that with Eternals, it's like, well, what if there were these superheroes, these alien gods that inspired every single hero that like Gilgamesh and Babylon, they inspired Athena and ancient Greece, like all these heroes were real and they were our MCU characters. So yeah, from the beginning, Nate and Kevin over at Marvel were like, let's go places that audiences have never seen before in cinema. And so Ron and I, from the beginning, we just sort of built this list of like, right. where are these amazing <clears throat> visual stunning places that we've never seen before? And really we like, pick these seven places and you know we pretty much went to every single one of them i can tell you one of our great regrets in the editing room was there's actually an amazing scene maybe they'll release it on disney plus that's an extended version of the india sequence in gupta india um and it was like a tragedy to cut that but it was just like the movie was like four hours long at one point so you got yeah you got to make choices i mean i'd love to see the four release the furpo cut Thank you. <laughs> Please get that trending button. Well, we need that, guys. No, it, this is the, we're really proud of the movie as it is. You know, it's a, it's a lot. It's a big and ambitious and challenging film. I'm really proud that it's something different. Um, and I think audiences are really embracing that craziness, which I think the world needs a little bit more like cosmic craziness. Um, but yeah, Ryan and, and really from the beginning, that, that Hiroshima scene, that Hiroshima scene was like a battle to include, but I thought it was really interesting and powerful. And I think, you know, only Chloe could have pulled something like that off. Yeah, definitely. It adds like a layer of depth to the whole movie. It adds like a obviously like a layer of sadness to it. And you could see why mm-hmm. someone like that in Eternal would want to walk away from that. Yeah, just the idea of um, the impact that ancient aliens had on uh, uh, on humanity over time. Um, you know, like one, that was one of the things I'm excited us most about the property, because one of, for me, one of my favorite movies of all time is 2001 A Space Odyssey, which is really kind of exploring the the, um, the evolution of human intelligence, you know, and, and, it, and it posits this idea that there was essentially an alien life form and this obelisk that came and gave us intelligence. And, uh, and so this was kind of our chance to sort of do a, a sort of a 2001, but through the lens of a superhero movie, which I thought was like super interesting from the beginning. So uh, yeah, I really applaud Marvel for kind of taking these big swings and um and just going with some going for some real gonzo ideas yeah yeah well, and you guys had said how you had like uh you know mythology and all these different stories told throughout time you guys had two characters you know independent of the eternals on set every single time in kid harrington and richard madden and i just got to know did they say listen guys you can call me john snow you can call me rob stark it's cool like because that's how i i'm like oh my god rob stark's in this i've been buying rob stark's you know stock since you know season two of, of uh game of thrones and all that kind of <laughs> stuff did you guys like pick their brains about game of thrones at all or did anyone else because i'm telling you like clearly i'm not nearly as I'm, I'm i'm not polished at all when it comes to anything in life basically but i would just i would have like just one night on set where i'd be like guys i just gotta ask like the red wedding what was that like or <laughs> like, like wait, all right wait till kit has a few in him I'd be like kit, what did you really think about the final season of game of thrones was there any kind of geeking out by anyone on set in terms of uh you know a couple of uh famous starks oh, on set true legends no from the <laughs> beginning we literally said to like we had this idea where like you know that's a that's a reunion I think the entire world wants to see. And to their great Marvel's great credit, you know, they made that happen, which is just so awesome. I think Richard did a fantastic job in the movie, but most importantly, like they're just like great guys. Like Kit Harrington is like a, literally the nicest dude. Like you want he's everyone thing you want Jon Snow to be in real life. Like that's really that's Kit. He's not like putting on a show. You know, I, we got the pleasure of spending some of the press week in Rome together and in London. It's just like 
he's just like a nice dude. I'm pretty sure he like filmed a video for Ryan's friend, who's like a big mm -hmm. fan of Jon Snow. And it's just like, he's just willing to do that stuff. So we didn't get to get the true dish uh, on season eight, <laughs> although we are huge Game of Thrones fans. And that was always like, you know, what show is so epic and so big and has these battle scenes. I'm pretty sure Chloe was straight up watching episodes of that, you know, while we were prepping just to figure out like how to stage some of this stuff. Um, they do history so well. And I, I will tell you, we're, we're all very excited for what Kit gets to do next, which we can't tell you. Oh, that's a tease. That's a tease. Man, come on. That's a good tease. Well, well, there's a literally a, there's a sniper yeah. out here. He's got like this Marvel hat on. I think it's, yeah, he's going to get me if I don't. He's listening in. So. so that's the other question I just have to ask, Bob. You know, I got to ask this question. And Always. I know the, fight, the, the hat man has this thing. You talked about how you had the little cards and you're playing the stories out. I have a theory. Yep. We've talked to, uh, you know, our guy Michael Waldron. We've talked to different people associated with the MCU over time. Yeah. I am convinced that there is a whiteboard in Feige's office. His office is probably like the floor <laughs> of an entire giant Disney complex or something. And there's just this whiteboard. And it's, you know, from, from part one of this new phase to the end of like 10 phases from now. Can you confirm? Confer yeah, 2042 <laughs> is where it goes. Can you confirm or deny just if there is a whiteboard and just how much of this Eternals movie is connected? Like, I feel like you guys probably like the purple color where they write in the, in the marker and they kind of connects everything. I feel like this movie is so important to this entire phase and the future phases where we're going to space, where we're having some weird funky stuff with you know your celestials maybe galactus coming in at some point king the conqueror all that kind of stuff um i i, I think we might have got something out of there right here <laughs> so, well, is there well, a whiteboard how point. big is it <laughs> there is this is but this is all i will ever say is like as, as far as we know as just mere peasants in the mc universe you know there is no master plan because the master plan is the people you know like kevin feige and nate moore and all the producers and victoria alonzo like those people like They've got this some master plan in their heads, but what they're really doing is they're trusting their artists and their creatives to like, mm -hmm. when we, we like to say this, like they're always saying like, here's the cup, like the MCU is this like beautiful glass. And they're like, you can add whatever you want to the glass as long as it doesn't affect what's already there. You know, so they're willing to just keep growing it and trying these different things and then finding that connective tissue. I mean, Michael Waldron's, an, he's the raddest dude. And you know, what he did with Loki and what that's going with Doctor Strange. I mean, I think he's going to be, like, I don't think he's instrumental in this whole phase and where it's going. And I can tell you, it's like the joy of it is it's a process of like, let the best idea win, you know, and everyone who's is so fluid. We're also, we've all seen all the movies. We all love the characters and we all were like, where can this go? You know, I, I want to see the Disney plus Eternals prequel where it's like Kumail gets a whole episode in like 1920s India where he's like Bollywood dealing with like Gandhi and like the whole revolution. I want to see like Angelina Jolie's episode in ancient Greece. The whole thing takes place in like Athens, you know, in the first century. So that all connects them to like the galaxy, the cosmos, yeah. you know, that was something we talked about from the beginning is like, we love Guardians. James Gunn, what he did with Guardians is like my favorite, one, one of my favorite offshoots of the MCU and also like RIP the Guardians after uh, volume three, you know, like we're going to have to say goodbye to some of these characters we really love. And so Eternals was this chance to like go all the way back and then go all the way forward. You know, and number two, we might go off into deep space, into the cosmos. We might meet some multiverse characters. Like we can really, the door's open now that we are fighting space gods. So that was really what Eternals was a chance to do is explore like, the furthest reaches and sort of the weirdest reaches of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. That was a great answer. I'm also just going to say that we're going to we're going to we'll attribute that to the sniper outside the window. You're not conforming or denying the whiteboard. The, white board board. Board. <laughs> the great the great whiteboard. I can just the only thing I can say for sure is that Kevin works Saturdays, like every Saturday. Oh Kevin wow, he's there. Like we because we, when we're in like crunch week and we're like crunching pages, and Ryan and I, you know, I'll, I'll have him tell you about like the Black Widow room, which is like a literal windowless room that you have a key card. You're like boop boop and oh, there's no cleaner so if you spill like grape nut cereal which like got us through the writing of this movie you will literally that pile of grape nut cereal will not <laughs> leave the ground for nine months until you get on your knees under the table and scoop it up because no one goes in those rooms except for kevin nate and us um and so yeah we would literally be out there on a saturday at like three in the afternoon like grinding and kevin would be like Hey guys, and then just like wandered into his office. So I don't know what he's doing other than just working hard. And I just have to add this, Rob. I, I know you got a question, but I had a just because you had mentioned the Guardians, and that's my favorite. Um, my mine yeah. and my family's like, but my my daughter, she's seven years old, and we kind of like she got into Guardians uh, one and two, and you kind of see a little of your family in it, and I absolutely love it. And 
that post credit scene, or excuse me, mid credits. I always like to make sure I get the, the right order there. The mid credit scene, I wrote in the notes, Robbie and I haven't even gotten to like do our recap of the movie yet. And I wrote, this feels like Guardians. And I don't know if that was done on purpose or if, but with the music and kind Corner of the track, track we have yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. it was, mwah, you gave me goosebumps. I got goosebumps talking about it. So I just want to say thank you for that. And was there a little bit of Guardians? Because I do feel like the Eternals world and the Guardians world does overlap because we're in this, you know, great beyond in space. I'll let Ryan take that one, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think that there's there's some overlap in the story, but all, but just in terms of the tone of what you're talking about, I think that, you know, um, the MCU has its own kind of language, you know, and its own feel and its own vibe for the different aspects of it. And I think, uh, J- and James Gunn did a great job kind of setting the tone for the kind of galactic um, uh, vibe, uh, arm of, of the MCU. And Taika kind of played off of that too. And yep. so... So, so this is us kind of like entering that world. So I think that's why you get this kind of vibe because it's adopting that kind of language as they go out into that uh, neighborhood, we'll say, of the MCU. That's a great way to put it too because I, I used to, I tell this to Robbie all the time. My eyes used to glaze over when I'd read the comic books and they'd enter space and I'd always be wondering like, how are they breathing out there? I could never like just enjoy <laughs> the art for what it was. And the way that I guess, like you said, you know, James did and Taika and then you guys kind of took that language and have now added your own little Rosetta Stone, you know, through that Rosetta Stone and have made it just, you know, bravo. And again, something so big as the Celestials and trying to figure out how big and massive and powerful they are. And then even the Eternals is something that I don't think it's easy to do for just you know a couple of morons like me going to the movie theater and you know us being able to like digest all that out um so just just great work on that dude we appreciate that I mean the best way I can sum it up is like it, look at the you know the, the ravager ship and like what their spaceships look like what James Gunn's doing with that and then just look at like the domo the eternal spaceship this like yeah. wedge this <laughs> triangular pyramid that's like this sacred tome of power i feel like that's the best way to describe like that's where we're gonna go in the mcu and, or into the gauze cosmos you know and then and play play a little jazz on what james did and all the work that he the incredible world building that he did that's one of the great pleasures of just being uh, a part of that universe is that you're really playing in the sandbox you know and you're playing with the toys that james gunn left behind when <laughs> he left you know to go to the suicide squad and so yeah we're fans too but most importantly you know we're storytellers and so for us we're just trying to make sure that people get something special out of the stories that we tell awesome for each of you what is it the most personal or your favorite scene in the eternals why don't you do? Why don't you go first, Cass? Because I, I, I have, have an answer. About this, just, yeah, 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 Ryan has yeah. the thing is Ryan has a lot of them. I'm sure because yeah. a lot of wrote a lot of those characters. For me, my favorite yeah. sequence, like just I mean, this is not a spoiler sequence. I don't think. Like it's really a Druig's challenge. Like first of all, mm-hmm. Barry Kogan like absolutely killed the movie. Like Druig yeah. runs away with it. I feel like I feel like people are like totally standing this relationship between like Druig and Makari, which was like a little afterthought, and they just like ate it up. You know, they ate it up on the screen, and so Druig's whole arc from essentially to lot the fall of Tenochtitlan in like the 1500s to like modern day Amazon, like that whole sequence just flies. And it's really because the conflict of these characters is so real. It's suddenly so like valid. Like if you could save the world and someone told you not to, you know, that would tear you up inside. It would destroy yeah. you. It's like saying like, hey, you can save your children from dying, but you're just, but you're not allowed to. Like, that's just it's it's enough to drive anyone mad you know and i think that that's very relatable it's also very complicated that it's sort of the first chance that i feel like we've been able to tackle big like existential questions in the mc where it's like if you were a god but you couldn't help your children like what would you do what would that happen and i think that just the jump scares those fight scenes it's some of like our proudest action and really like I'm sure people will spot the reference when they see the movie, but the, the Revenant, we like pulled a whole bit out of the Revenant in there where he's just, yeah. you know, Icarus is getting, like I said, who I don't know if everyone saw seen the movie when they listened I to this. I thought that you know, was so lot, similar. Yeah. I'm glad you said that because seeing it there's just a lot, on top of yeah. it, I was like, man, this is like fucking Leo and the Revenant. It's yeah, just really exactly. intense. That was, that was the big mission, right? Our mission is always to say like, can you make somebody feel, so, rather than just be like, you know, action's fun to watch, but you really want to make somebody feel feel that stuff when like these things could kill Icarus, you know, these, these deviants really are deadly. Um, and I think that whole sequence really team too, because they made them look oh terrifying, terrifying. Yeah. One of the scariest things I've ever yeah. seen in the MCU. <laughs> well, Stefan the and the whole, like, yeah. yeah, they did. They just also, we can, this is like the only way I can thank a pandemic, but you know, we had an extra few right. months because of our delay to really nail that stuff. And they just went above and beyond. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for me, I really loved, uh, basically the Bollywood sequence that leads to, that sets up Kingo's character in the present day. I mean, that was an idea that we had really early on. And I feel like there's just kind of a lot of myself in Kingo 
because I'm somebody that also just sort of uh, in times of crisis or stress, we'll kind of resort to comedy as a sort of defense mechanism. And I think that's 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 a layer to Kingo's character that maybe not everybody um, is picking up on that, you know, he's obviously the comic relief, but it's coming from a place of vulnerability and insecurity and, and fear, really. Um, so so the Kingo character um, and Kumail's performance, it's some, that's some of my favorite stuff uh, in the movie. Kumail and, and Kingo, the character, was my favorite part personally. I'm such a big fan of his, like, as an actor, his whole yeah, career. Me too. So I was very excited yeah. to see him. And I was like, I hope Kingo is going to be my favorite character. And he wound up being my favorite character. I love the whole <laughs> sequence of oh, the this, cameraman this, this, and the oh, assistant. Oh, it's so funny. Yeah. A little a little fun fact, which we will tell you, because it's just, it's just how it went down. We literally yeah. basically pitched from, like, the jump. We were like... We love Kamal. We love everything he's pretty much done, specifically like Silicon Valley and just what he yep. was up to. And we basically pitched uh, the producers right from the beginning, like, this has got to be Kamal. And they were like, it can't be because he's got a role in Guardians of the Galaxy 3. James Gunn has already written him into it, so he can't do Eternals. And we were like, oh, it's such a bummer because like, who else could it be? So perfect. And then, as you may know, Guardians had its own little kerfuffle. Um, and the movie got you know delayed like a year and a half and then the pandemic happened and basically... You know, I don't know what that role was going to be, but I really think that he could, it couldn't have gone better for him because he basically yeah. freed up, his schedule freed up. And then Marvel's like, yeah, you know, actually, I think we could, we could probably go out to him. And then the rest is history. I mean, he just got like leading man ripped and he's also just hysterical. <laughs> he is so ripped I think that, now. It's crazy. Yeah. 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 yeah he could get yeah, all of our asses. He, he maintained it. You know, he's, he's still, <laughs> still looks great. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a, one of those like accident, like it was a genuine happy accident. We were actually at Marvel when all that stuff went down with Guardian. So it was like a crazy week. Yeah, but that was one yeah. of those like happy accidents that I wonder to this day what would have happened was... if he had done Guardians 3 instead of Eternals. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's out. That's the day <laughs> that I. It's literally because of a tweet, like because yeah, yeah. of one tweet, like that Kingo's now in this movie, or rather Kumail's now is Kingo, the legendary. Yeah. You know, like he's like yeah. I would say he's one of the breakouts. You know, he really no people doubt. really love him. I just like my grandma was like, who, I loved him. What was his name? I'm like, oh, his name's Kumail Nanjiani. She's like, he's great. You know, so if 95 year olds like him <laughs> and uh, kids like him, I think he won. We got you guys on. You guys wrote this 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 brilliant movie. Um, I gotta say. We heard, uh, we heard Ajax say it, it, it you know, how the, uh, you know, she was in the mission and she was ready to, you know, see it to the end. And then this big purple man came into our world and he <laughs> snapped away half the universe and it changed her perspective, seeing the way humans, you know, got together, did whatever they could do, snap them back. Is it fair to say that Thanos saved Earth? Is that a fair mm, statement to me? Because as, yeah. as a Thanos defender here on yeah. the podcast, I feel like the big purple guy might have uh, might have been the reason that Earth uh, lives to see another day in the MCU. Ryan's also a Thanos defender, so it's really funny. Like I feel like you guys have a lot mm -hmm. to talk about. Like Ryan has got all kinds of feelings about the, the big purple man. I'll stick I with would you, say Kaz. that yeah, you and adversity, me. I'm, I'm out on yeah, Thanos. Yeah, just no bullshit. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, it was it was really that like. You know, the, the the question we always led up to is, you know, the modern day, the atomic age, sort of the yeah. rise of exactly. superheroes. And we really said, like, that was the moment when, when Earth started to defend itself. That was the moment when the Eternals sort of looked at each other and said, like, this, whatever is happening here is one of a kind. You know, this Earth, yeah. this planet, this timeline, this era, like, it's not like the others. It's not, you know, and that's that was really the moment yeah. that I made it worth saving. So I personally maybe would argue it was Cap. It was Cap that made the yeah. you know, once, Cap, once Cap came of age and sort of became the first Avenger, that was when the Eternals started to take notice. But this is my own theory. It's not. A yeah, theory, I think. Know? And yeah, I think that right. some people might say right. some people might say it was your. <laughs> I think that uh, it was. I think the answer is like both because the truth is that um, spiritually, what Kaz is saying is true because also there's like a subtextual layer to. Uh, in the idea of of evolution, whether it's good or bad, because in the yep. movie, and I guess we're just talking uh, spoiler. Are we spoilering or how do we? Uh, anyway, we're at the end of the interview, so <laughs> in the if you movie, haven't seen yeah. Eternals at this point, yeah. Yeah. turn this interview off. Go see yeah. Eternals. Come back to it. Well, yeah. So, so as Erisham says, you know, he originally created the Deviants, and then the evolution is what they evolved to become apex predators and started basically um, eating the very life forms that they're meant to protect. And, uh, and then so he made the Eternals, he designed them to not evolve so that they would just essentially stay static. Um, and so then, so then, uh, but then when you see humanity, you watch how humanity has evolved over time throughout the movie and, and with Cap and with the Atomic Age and with the, the birth of superheroes, you see the, 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 the good in humanity um, evolving us to a higher place, to a better place. And so, uh, so spiritually then that's what Ajak is picking up on. 
But then literally, um, as, as things went down, if Thanos hadn't done that, then I don't think she would have had that change of heart. So I think the answer is basically it's a little bit of both. All right. It's, it's a great it, answer for this first, podcast. We each got that's actually a little is bit. true. <laughs> 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 each got Guys, this has been a blast. We loved Eternals. Both of us were excited to talk about it, excited to recap it together. Um, everyone go see it. If you haven't seen Eternals yet, you're going to love it. If you're an MCU fan, especially if you're like a sci-fi nerd, this one was like half superhero, half sci-fi for me. It, it just hit on all the levels it needed to. Thank you so much for joining us and talking about it. And we will see you guys whenever your next project is. I, I promise you, I'll buy tickets to it. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Robbie, this is a pleasure, man. You guys get it.